So who is this witty person you're thinking? Uh, or not? Uh, my name is Charlie Kyle. I'm the principal of Innes College, and I'm delighted to host this evening with Jeremy Rifkin. Uh, before we begin uh, with the customary introductions, I want to read the Statement of Acknowledgement of Traditional Land. And for that, I require my helpful specs. We wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. I often like to say just a few other words beyond the actual acknowledgement, um, typically to have us think uh, carefully about what it means to be stewards of the land, and I think particularly with tonight's topic being what it is, um, the notion of stewardship is especially important. So um, we are lucky to have this land to use, and I think as you'll find in the course of this evening's talk, to use it wisely is paramount. So um, I'm very much looking forward to what Jeremy has to say, uh, as are the two speakers I will introduce, because as you know, at the University of Toronto, no event can take place without the required three speakers before the main event. <laughs> so I will introduce each of our speakers who will then, in turn, who will then come up and say a few words about Jeremy. Uh, and then, yes, finally, Jeremy will appear and he will speak. And he does not use a podium, so I am podiumless. I'm not used to this. Um, so our first introducer is Toby Heaps. Uh, Toby Heaps is the CEO and co-founder of Corporate Knights Incorporated, a research firm that publishes the sustainable business magazine of the same name, Corporate Knights, without the ink, and produces rankings and financial product ratings based on corporate sustainability performance. Toby spearheaded the first global ranking of the world's 100 most sustainable corporations in 2005, and in 2007 coined the term clean capitalism, which means, quote, an economic system in which prices incorporate social, economic, and ecological benefits and costs, and actors know the full impact of their actions. So, Toby Heaps. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, so, I, um, I'm not going to read Jeremy's bio. You all have access to it, and presumably you're here because you know something about the man. Uh, I've had the, the privilege and honor of seeing Jeremy in action sort of close up over the last uh, half decade, um, bringing his message uh, with him and, and some other executives to uh, premiers and cabinet ministers to, um, to help them sort of um, understand the direction the world's going in and how to, how to make some sense out of all the complexity out there. And the two um, observations and takeaways I have from Jeremy, you know, you can, it, it takes a lot of guts to, uh, to try and predict the future. Um, some would say you almost have to be a pugilist um, in this day and age to try and predict the future. But what makes Jeremy really special is he's kind of a rare mixture of Beethoven and Anne Frank. Uh, so uh, let me explain. So on the, on the Beethoven side, um, Jeremy has his ear close to the ground and there's all this noise out there civilization is making, but he's able to hear some of the music that the universe is playing and then to rewrite that in, in his books and, and bring it to people. And on the, the Anne Frank side, uh, I think Jeremy, uh, and this helps to explain why some of his predictions take a little longer to, to pass than, um, than, than some of his books say they're, they're going to pass, is I think he, he really believes that people are, are good at heart and, uh, and sometimes um, uh, uh, I think that's true, and the arc of history shows that that's true with progress, but sometimes we have to expend all the other alternatives so it take, can take, take a little bit longer. But I think the great news, and, and uh, the people who've been listening really closely to Germany, to, uh, you know, whether it's the leaders in Germany um, or in, in China in particular, um, they are presiding over the economies that are now the fastest growing and most powerful and strongest economies in the world, and it's not a coincidence. And, and the reason is, is you know, what, what Jeremy's preaching about and, 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 and helping to describe and, 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 and imagine in a structured way so people can fit into it is, is a world where we can live in harmony with the planet instead of in opposition to the planet, which is a message that um, if there's ever a time where it's relevant, it's definitely now. And 
Whereas before it was really about doing the noble thing or the environmentally just thing. While that's still true, it now is more about doing the economically smart thing. And what Jeremy sort of looks for, and this is sort of the real art, I think, of people who are trying to shape and predict and get other people inside of the future, is not to look outside and see what is, you know, all the different cars running on gasoline, what is. It's not even just to look under the hood and sort of see how fast the type of transportation is not one metaphor for the change that's happening. Is, um, you know, what, what type of cars are being sold this year, you know, more and more are, are electric or, or zero emissions, but it's to see the rate of change. And that's a faint signal that a lot of people um, don't necessarily see. They just see the sort of the ocean of what's there. And, and Jeremy sees the ocean of what's coming and he weaves it together. And I don't think he's ever been more right about anything in his life than um, this upcoming book he has, which is the Green New Deal. And our, our, our current government, we didn't hear a lot about it in the election campaign, but probably the most consequential decision they will make in this mandate will be how they deal with the economic contraction, which will call upon the government to spend hundreds, possibly hundreds of billions of dollars and to choose on how they spend that, whether it's going to go to the same old type of spending of roads and things like that, or the type of infrastructure, the green infrastructure that Jeremy's talking about that can catapult us to the, to the next stage. So without further ado, I'll hand it back to our esteemed host, and thank you for coming out on this uh, beautiful uh, sort of winter evening. Now, uh, this evening would not have come together uh, were it not for the efforts of uh, our next speaker. Um, I've known Eddie Moretti for longer than either of us, I guess, would want to confess. Uh, he was a student of mine. And you'll no doubt say, well, hard to know. He must have been 10. Um, <laughs> but uh, Eddie Moretti uh, has had a, we could say, varied and certainly productive career since his days as a cinema studies undergraduate here at Innes College. Uh, while pursuing his doctoral degree at NYU, Eddie became involved in the broader realm of media, eventually serving as the chief creative uh, director at Vice Media. He is now a true multi-hyphenate. He is a film producer. His latest venture is the drama The Report with Adam Driver and Annette Bening, um, which, if you look carefully, because it is being handled by Amazon, is in select theaters only. So certainly it is at the light box as we speak. <coughs> Uh, if you wish to see it in the theater, and I would I pray as a, a professor of cinema studies that you make that choice. Um, but if you do not, it will be on Amazon by the end of the month, or Prime by the end of the month, and it's while we're seeing. Uh, he is also co-founder with Paolo Spadafora of a tech company called Epiphany that provides digital banking solutions. And I said he was a multi-hyphenate. Uh, most relevant to tonight's event, he is the co-founder with former CNBC host Dylan Radigan of The Lemonade Way which aims to be a game changer in the movement from an extractive to a regenerative economy, driving capital toward asset opportunities of ecological value. Uh, and he also wanted me to mention, because he's footing the bill, that each of you will get, I feel like Oprah, each of you will get a copy of the Green New Deal, uh, Jeremy's new book, uh, in the lobby uh, after the talk is done. And without further ado, you can now thank your benefactor, Eddie Moretti. Good evening. Um, s about five years ago, um, I've been living in America for about 25 years now. About five years ago, I was uh, dutifully listening to CBC radio on, on Sirius um, uh, satellite radio. And there was a program called Ideas. You know this program? You are definitely an ideas crowd, aren't you? <laughs> You're the demo. Um, and I was doing the dishes. It wasn't particularly loud in the house. And I heard this. Um, great voice uh, of this man um, talking about two generations of uh, full employment over the next 50 years. And I stopped doing the dishes and I turned up the radio louder um, because it seemed so impossible to hear someone. I think he was debating uh, Bob Ray, formerly the NDP guy. Um, and, um, and, I, and, I, and Bob, Bob was not positive on uh, future employment. Um, with this coming AI and technological revolution, but Jeremy was. And so I, I, I needed to know more about this man, and I read three of his books, um, The Third Industrial Revolution, uh, The Zero Marginal Cost Society, and The Empathic Civilization. And um, I picked up the phone, I called his office, I got on the train, I went from New York to DC, I met him, 
and a relationship, a friendship, um, and an intellectual conversation began. It's lasted these last five years. I made a documentary called The Third Industrial Revolution, which is online on YouTube for free. <clears throat> and, um, and lately, um, I've morphed my media career uh, to uh, pursue other passions. It's particularly um, suiting to be in here tonight, so thank you to Charlie and, the, and, the, and Cinema Studies and in his college for hosting this, because this college is where they have cinema studies and urban studies. I never did any of the urban studies, but it looks like I'm definitely getting into the game now. Because what I've done is started this new company called Lemonade, um, which is creating a methodology which we call the Lemonade Way. And you can all go um, and check out the website, thelemonadeway.com. Um, and the idea is to look at the world around us, like Toby said, and plan and sequence redevelopment of the built infrastructure around us in order to um, be more productive. And this is something Jeremy will talk about. Um, the economy, the second industrial revolution, as he would say, is coming to an end. Um, and a new um, economic paradigm is gonna emerge. This is not a fossil fuel economy. It's economy built on a new distributed energy, mobility, and communications grid. And if you're smart, um, it's the place to find new value. GDP is slowing all over the world. It's inevitable. It will slow until we get off of an old paradigm onto a new one. Uh, w where I'm living now, I'm still a Canadian citizen. I didn't adopt American citizenship, nor will I, I think. <laughs> There's no need to right now. Um, they talk about the Green New Deal. It's a very di divisive subject in America, but it's wrong. It shouldn't be divisive. Um, and perhaps the, the current... Green New Deal plans in America are a little broad in scope. Jeremy's vision and the book that you're going to get tonight after the lecture um, is a very infrastructure-focused Green New Deal. Not enough people are talking about inf infrastructure. You want to get out of this whole redesign the infrastructure. Here in Canada, there in America, down in South America, everywhere. China's doing it, Europe's doing it, everyone else is lagging. This book is going to um, introduce you to how not only to structure this um, shift to a new infrastructure, but very importantly, how to pay for it because the money is there and it's not just some government top-down approach. So it's my great pleasure to introduce one of my friends and one of the most important thinkers and one, one of the most relevant thinkers of today, Jeremy Rifkin. Good evening, everyone. Very nice to be in Toronto, and I'm particularly pleased to be here at the Innes Town Hall. Uh, when I began writing books uh, in the early 1970s, I came across Harold Innes and Marshall McLuhan, and I have to say they had a very big influence, and I like to think that I followed in some small way with uh, the path that they led uh, for many of us uh, in the academic world. And uh, I want to thank Eddie Moretti for uh, thinking about this particular venue. It's a really uh, great occasion for me. It's a strange planet we live in, full of life. We've been out there exploring the universe now since uh, we send the first satellites up to space. We can't find a damn thing. Nothing. The most exciting thing we found was what we think was some dirty water in Mars. We have millions and millions of species inhabiting this little oasis in the universe. Many of them have no name. We haven't even identified them yet. We're the youngest species. As far as we know, we are the babies. 
Anatomically modern humans have been here less than 200,000 years. And for most of that time, 190,000 years, we lived in small forager hunter bands, living off the land, the income, not the capital of the earth. About 10,000 years ago, the last ice age, we moved into a very temperate climate regime, the Holocene. And for 10,000 years, we have inhabited this particular time in human history and global history. We began agriculture, and then in the last 200 years, the Industrial Revolution. Essentially, what's happened is this. By the way, you're going to have to put all your phones down, everything away. About 200 years ago, we discovered riches deeply buried from a previous period of history, 300 million years ago, the Carboniferous era. And we dug down under the earth, and we exhumed those bodies of living things that existed so long ago. And now those bodies had metamorphosed into coal, oil, and gas. We've been exhuming that burial ground for two centuries. We've created an entire civilization based on fossil fuels. Our fertilizers, our pesticides, our construction materials, our synthetic fiber, our preservatives for our food, our packaging, our power, our transport, our heat, our light. It's an endless list. And we kidded ourselves by believing that we are building wealth when actually we are living off the dead remains of a previous period of history. This was a short-lived experience because we've exhumed so much of this oil, coal, and gas, and now we've burned it to create this industrial way of life, and we now find ourselves in real-time climate change. We have spread so much CO2 and methane and nitrous oxide in the atmosphere of this little planet, we just can't get enough of the sun's heat off the Earth. The sun's heat comes down to Earth, it comes back out, and it hits those molecules and comes back down. Let me explain what climate change does, because if it were ever really explained, the entire human race, as of tonight, would be motivated and driven with only one mission, save life on this planet. Here's what we're never told. The climate change we're experiencing is because we're changing the water cycles of the Earth. That's what this is all about. We're the watery planet. Our biomes and ecosystems have evolved over millions of years based on the hydrological cycle and the water that traverses the clouds and bathes our biomes and ecosystems. Here's the rub. For every one degree that the temperature of this planet goes up because of global warming emissions, the atmosphere is actually sucking up 7% more precipitation from the ground because the heat is forcing that precipitation into the clouds, so we're getting more concentrated precipitation in the clouds and more extreme, uncontrollable, out-of-control water events. 70, 80 below zero up with a polar vortex up here in Canada, up to Alaska. Massive snows in the winter. Not only the winter, Guadalajara had massive ice sheets coming down on them in the summer. We have spring floods. I'll go to my country on this. In the last several years, the entire midsection of the United States has been under floods for two, three, and four months because of the Mississippi and Missouri basins from the north all the way down to the Gulf. And this year, the floods were so severe, the crops did not come in, and the federal government had to subsidize the farmers. And here's the story we're not hearing on the mass media. There are so many families that have lost their homes. They don't have flood insurance. They've been flooded out. We have small towns across the midsection of the United States evacuating. They're deserted. And people are living with their relatives in other parts of the country. This is the new abnormal, as Jerry Brown, the former governor, would have said. We have summer droughts and wildfires. I don't have to tell you. I'll tell my experience. My wife and I had planned a trip to Vancouver a couple of years ago. We're coming in on the trip, and the uh, pilot announces on the plane, we have smoke coming in. And I turned to my wife, and I said, he means, he, he doesn't mean, I'm sorry, he said we have fog coming in. And what he really meant is that we have uh, a, a severe situation with smoke because of the wildfires across British Columbia. This summer, or just a few weeks ago, Los Angeles was on fire, totally on fire. We had to take off the power grid in all of Northern California two or three times now. Millions of people had no power because they were afraid the whole state would go up in flames. 
This is happening all over the world. We have summer droughts and wildfires, but now there's no reprieve because after that comes the hurricane season. And we have category three, four, and five hurricanes battering every coastal line across the planet. We've had five massive hurricanes in six weeks a few months ago across the southeast part of the United States, the coastal areas, and Bahamas are wiped out. Our ecosystems cannot catch up to this runaway water cycle. Not in evolutionary terms, it's too fast. And we are seeing the collapse of ecosystems all over the world. Our scientists tell us, and I want every parent and grandparent to hear this, and if there are some young millennials and Gen Zs here, our scientists are telling us we are in the sixth extinction of life on Earth. Doesn't even make the headlines. This is the most important, dramatic story we've ever faced in our short 200,000 year sojourn. Most people don't even know it's happening. There have been five mass extinction events on this planet in 450 million years, well before human beings were here. Each time there was a tipping point in the chemistry of the planet and massive quick die out, and on average 10 million years to get new forms of life on this earth. We are in the sixth extinction of life on earth. We're well into it. And our scientists are telling us we are likely to lose to extinction over half the species inhabiting this planet in the next eight decades. That's the decades of the millennial and Gen Z generation. The last time we had an extinction of this magnitude was 65 million years ago, and it took place over thousands of years. We are asleep. We are really asleep. But the younger generation, Gen Zs in high school, the millennials into the workforce, they're awakening. In the last six months, there have been three strikes. Millions and millions of young people have walked out of their classrooms, walked out of their offices and where they work, onto the streets in 130 countries in the world to declare a climate emergency and call for a Green New Deal. What I recognized recently, it just came to me, this isn't like any protest in history. We've had protests all through history. We like to protest. That's the kind of species we are. So we've had uh, protests uh, uh, around religious struggles and tribal blood wars and ideological struggles and social grievances and righting wrongs. This is different. This is the first planetary revolt in human history. This is the first time a cohort of human beings across all boundaries, borders, and isms began to see itself as an endangered species, the end of the other, an endangered species. And this is the first time the generations began to see their fellow creatures as part of the evolutionary family. And this is the first time in history that a generation has begun to see the biosphere as their indivisible community. This is an extraordinary moment in history. Let's hope it hasn't come too late. So, it's becoming increasingly clear that the industrial age based on fossil fuels is in a deep decline. It's in a death knell. We can smell it. So what we need now is a new economic vision for the world that needs to be compelling. We need a game plan to deliver on that vision. It needs to be very quick. And it has to move as quickly in the developing world as in the industrialized nations and we have to be off a of carbon-based civilization. Off, not net zero, off. And we've got about 20 years to get this job done. This is a razor-thin path. Our scientists in the U.S. Panel on Climate Change, all the thousands of scientists that have been advising and warning us, they issued their last, I think, dire warning. In 2018, they said, the temperature on the Earth is now going up one degree Celsius, if it goes beyond one and a half degrees Celsius, we're going to see a cascading series of environmental events, climate disasters that are going to take us into an unknown, uncharted world that we can't even imagine. We have no playbook to understand it. And we got 12 years to turn it around. That was a year ago. Now we have 11. And what they're saying is that we need a total transformation of civilization in one generation that separates the millennials and the Gen Zs and from their kids. So we need to step back. 
and ask this question. How do the great economic revolutions in history occur? If we know how they occurred, we're going to get a compass and a road map here in Ontario, in Canada, and around the world that's going to allow us to chart a new journey very quickly and hopefully to exit the fossil fuel civilization. There have been at least seven major economic paradigm shifts in history. They're very interesting anthropologically. They share a common denominator. And that is, at a moment of time, three defining technologies converge across a civilization. Often it's serendipitous, so it has only happened a few times. Three defining technologies converge across a civilization to create a new infrastructure that fundamentally transforms the way society manages, powers, and moves its economic activity, its social life, its governance. What are those three defining revolutions? Well, Harold Innes and Marshall McLuhan got the first one, communication revolutions. So that we can bring larger collectivities of people together, annihilate time and space, and begin to relate in larger social units. The second is new energy regimes that allow us, again, to bring larger collectivities of people together over time and space and power a more advanced society. And I put that in quotes. And three, new sources of mobility and logistics, again, to bring larger collectivities of our species together to have the mobility we need to manage these more expansive societies. When communication revolutions converge with new energy regimes and new modes of mobility and logistics, it does fundamentally change the way we manage power and move our social life, economic life, and our governance. It changes our temporal spatial orientation. It changes our business models. It changes our governance. It changes our narratives and our worldviews. I'm going to give you two quick examples. First Industrial Revolution in Britain in the 19th century, second Industrial Revolution in the U.S. in the 20th century. The Brits take us into the first Industrial Revolution with a revolution in communication, steam-powered printing. No more German manual print presses, too slow. Steam-powered printing, very fast, so we could produce massive print really cheaply for something new called textbooks for public schools, or otherwise we could never have had universal education, and newspapers and magazines and journals and catalogs. Then the Brits laid out a telegraph system in the last half of the 19th century across the British Isles. Steam power printing and the telegraph, those communication technologies, converge with a new source of energy. We exhumed the coal from the Carboniferous era, and we harvested with that steam engine. Then we put the steam engine on rails, locomotives, national transport, industrial urban life. If you know uh, the way an infrastructure is engineered, its communication, its energy, its mobility, and logistics, you know pretty much about what its habitats are going to look like and what its opportunities and restraints are in terms of economic models that accompany it and governing models. The first industrial revolution brought larger collectivities together. The railroad helped and the telegraph and we went from little local markets in a rural life to national markets, and with national markets, we needed nation states to govern them. Second Industrial Revolution, the United States. Another convergence of communication, energy, and mobility to manage power and move society. In this case, the telephone was a really big deal. I mean, in a sense, we could understand the Internet after the telephone, but there was nothing before the telephone that would give us any sense that someone could pick it up and then virtually talk to someone a 1,000 miles away instantaneously and get a response. You know the word phony? It comes from phones because they thought it was a magic trick. It was a phony. It wasn't real. That wasn't the person. It took a while to get used to it. Later, radio and television. And these communication technologies in the United States, they converged with a new source of energy. The Texas oil wells came in. Then Henry Ford in 1908 put everyone in the Model T. And this moved us from urban to suburban life. And this took us across the 20th century. And it moved us from national markets to global markets with container ships and jet travel. And as we moved to globalization, we had to create global institutions to help manage them, like the OECD and the IMF and the World Bank, et cetera. The first and second industrial revolutions gave us capitalism. Because it was so expensive, you know, fossil fuels and now nuclear power are the most expensive energies in the world to extract. 
And therefore, you could not finance it with a monarchy or rich family, so you had to have the stockholding corporations, both for extraction of energy and the locomotives. Railroads were really expensive. So that gave birth to capitalism. And the Soviets had to do it in kind of a similar way because the platforms were designed to be centralized, top-down, proprietary and intellectual property, and you had to vertically integrate big, giant companies to get the return on investments because it was such an expensive energy regime. And therefore, every other institution along the line that relied on fossil fuels had to integrate into vertically integrated organizations. And we ended up at the end of the Second Industrial Revolution with 500 global corporations. I taught many of the CEOs that are online there right now at the Wharton School, an advanced management program. There's 500 CEOs, 500 companies, and these 500 companies are responsible for one-third of the GDP of the world. And they only have 62, 67 million workers in a workforce of three and a half billion, which should tell you something. It does tell you something. The seven richest individuals in that grouping, seven individuals, you could put them in this row, their combined wealth, the seven richest people, now equals the accumulated wealth of one half the human beings living on Earth. <laughs> three and a half billion people. There's something wrong here and the way we're organizing our economic relationships on this planet. But those platforms, those infrastructures, tell us a lot about the economic models and the governing models. So where do we go from here? I'm going to share an anecdote with you. When Angela Merkel became uh, chancellor, she asked me to come to Berlin in the first couple of weeks of her new government to help her address the question how to grow the German economy and create uh, jobs on her watch. When I got to Berlin, the first question I asked the new chancellor, I said, Madam Chancellor, how do you grow the German economy when your businesses are plugged into a second industrial revolution infrastructure of centralized telecommunications, fossil fuel and nuclear power, internal combustion, road, rail, water, and air transport, and that infrastructure to manage power and move the collective Germany, it peaked in its performance its productivity in every industrial country in the world over the last 20 years. Now, let's talk about productivity, which is not my favorite term. I prefer generativity. We'll get that later, or regenerativity. But this is very interesting. Um, I'm going to share a little secret with you that um, economists are uh, really embarrassed about and they don't want anyone to know about, so I'm going to share it with you, and then you can share it with all your friends. We used to believe that there was two major uh, uh, components in productivity, better machines and better performing workers. But when Robert Solow won his Nobel Prize on economic growth theory, he let the little secret out. He said, well, actually, when we track every single year of the Industrial Revolution, these two factors only account for 14% of the productivity. Where's the other 86%? They don't know. It's called the Solow residual. Would you be surprised that economists don't know? You would think that's the one thing they would know. I'm going to give you a short lesson on why they didn't know. When we penned economic theory, the vogue was Newton's physics, because he had just, we thought, unlocked the secrets of the universe, right? So everybody wanted to borrow his metaphors. So the new economic philosophers borrowed his metaphors, too. You know uh, Newton's law, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction? Does that sound familiar? The invisible hand of the marketplace. For every action on the supply side, there's an equal and opposite reaction on the, on the demand side. You know Newton's law, a body in motion stays in motion, less disrupted, sound familiar? Baptists say, borrow that line to suggest that supply will stimulate demand, which will generate more supply, which will stimulate demand unless disrupted by an outside force. He forgot to say those are called monopolies, all right? The only thing wrong with penning all of economic theory based on Newton's physics is actually Newton's physics doesn't have anything to do with economic activity except for friction. Economic activity is based on the same laws that govern the universe, the solar system, the biosphere, the economy, and everything you did today in Toronto. These are the first and second laws of thermodynamics discovered in the late 19th century by chemists and engineers. I'm going to give you just a quick on this. The first law of energy in the universe is all the energy that's here in the universe has been here since the Big Bang. We haven't created any more energy or destroyed the energy that exists. That's a conservation law. But the second law says, well, that's true, but energy is always changing form, but only in one direction, from concentrated, the Big Bang, to dispersed through the galaxies, from really hot to dispersed and cold through the galaxies, from order to disorder through the galaxies. Entropy is a measure of the energy still available. We can't get useful work. So here's what it's all about. 
we take available energy and material out of the earth. Now, we get the sun, so don't worry. We got plenty of sun. But the rare earths in your smartphone uh, or the metallic ore on your car, they've been here since we blew off the sun and cooled off and created these things on earth. We only get a few meteorites down here, all right, and a little cosmic dust. So we take uh, energy out of nature, a metallic ore, a, a rare earth, a, a fossil fuel, and we extract them, we store them, we ship them, we refine them, we produce goods and services out of them, we consume them, and then we recycle them back to the earth. In every step of the conversion of nature's resources through our society back to nature, we have to embed a certain amount of energy and material energy into that good or service to get it to the next stage of its journey. But in the process of each conversion, we lose a certain amount of that energy and material energy. This is called aggregate efficiency. Aggregate efficiency is the ratio of useful to potential work in every conversion around the world. And it's not just in the human economy. If a lion in the wild chases down an antelope and kills it and devours it, only about 10 to 20 percent of the total energy in that antelope gets into the lion. The rest is heat loss in the conversion. That's its aggregate efficiency. So you're saying, is this guy out of his mind? What does this have to do with Chancellor Merkel? I thought I was coming here about green. So I said to the Chancellor, she's a physicist, and I said, we started the second industrial revolution in the U.S. in 1905, 1904, 5, with about 3 percent aggregate efficiency. America, the U.S., we got up to about 14 percent aggregate efficiency, and we trailed off in the late 90s. Germany got up to 18.5 percent aggregate efficiency, and Japan led the world at 20 percent aggregate efficiency, all leveled off. That's all you can get. Why is this important? A new generation of economists who happen to study thermodynamics, they looked at uh, the Industrial Revolution, they factored in aggregate efficiency with better machines and better workers, and that amounts to most of the rest of the productivity. Every engineer knows what I'm saying, and every chemist, and every biologist, and every architect, because they have to study the laws of thermodynamics. Not a single business school in the world, including the Wharton School, teaches the basic laws that govern all of our activity. How about that? So what I said to the chancellor, you can have market reform, labor reform, fiscal reform, you can stimulate a million startup companies, but if they're plugged into that old second industrial revolution infrastructure, centralized telecommunication, fossil fuel, nuclear power, internal combustion, transport, you can't get any more mileage its performance has now edged. We are in a death knell. We know this in the business community. So on that first day, we discussed a third industrial revolution, a new convergence of communication, energy, mobility, and logistics to change society. And at the end of the day, the chancellor said, Jeremy, we're going to have this for Germany. We're going to have this for the European Union. I'll come back to that in a while. Here's the new convergence of communication, energy, and mobility. Uh, everybody here has their cell their smartphones tonight. We got four and a half billion people connected. It's been 29 years since the World Wide Web, Bernard Lee. Pretty soon everyone's going to be connected. Do you know the Chinese and Koreans now have a smartphone for $25 with more computing power than sent our astronauts to the moon? In the Amazon tonight, there are people in the palm of their hand with more potential computing power than sent our people to the moon. This suggests there's something big happening here, right? $25. Now this digitized communication internet is now converging just now with a digitized renewable energy internet. We now have millions of people um, in their homes, in their small businesses, in their cooperatives, in their communities around the world who are producing their own solar and wind. And what they're not using, they're sharing back on an increasingly digitized renewable energy internet and they're sharing that between millions of players using the same digitized analytics and algorithms that we use to share news, knowledge, and entertainment on the communication internet. It's just doing it with energy. Now these two internets, the communication internet, the renewable energy internet, all digitized, are converging with a third and final internet, mobility and logistics. Made up of electric and fuel cell vehicles, powered by solar and wind from the energy internet, and those vehicles will be autonomous in the coming eight or nine years, and they will be managed on the road by the same digitized analytics and algorithms we use on the other two internets. It's a seamless internet. Communication, energy, mobility, logistics. 
And these three internets ride on top of a platform called the Internet of Things. Now, you know we're putting sensors all over the world. You have sensors in your homes, sensors in smart cars, sensors in warehouses, smart roads, factories, even the agricultural fields. And these little sensors are picking up data. And that data is going to other machines, and it's particularly to the communication energy mobility internets that are starting to emerge. By 2030, we're going to connect the world. What we're doing here is establishing a prosthesis of the human brain and nervous system. But I should say, all of our infrastructure revolutions do that. If it sounds familiar when I say that every infrastructure revolution brings larger collectivities together across time and space to manage power and move their data life, why does that sound familiar? You probably took biology. Every cell and every organism has to have a means to communicate. Every cell and every organism has to have a source of energy to stay in a non-equilibrium state away from death. Every cell and every organism has to have some motility and mobility or it can't live and survive. Our infrastructures are a prosthesis, prosthesis that allows large collectivities to come together as a social being in bigger units. Not rocket science, actually not in any textbooks. Common sense. So, the Internet of Things. The brain this time is Galileo and GPS. They're synchronizing the sensors down here. We're going to have ubiquitous sensor Internet of Things um, seamless infrastructure by 2030. On the upside, big leap forward for humanity. Potentially, in quotes. Because now, we're going to be able to bring the human race together with very low fixed and marginal cost who can engage in commerce and trade in high-tech SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises. Cooperatives are going to come back big with this one. And they can bypass many of the global corporations that mediated commerce and trade in the 19th and 20th century, and they can bypass nation states. It's not just Scotland and Quebec and... Uh, and uh, Catalonia, all over the world where I'm traveling, the local regions and the local business communities with this smart technology are engaging each other in blockchain cooperatives. They're starting all over the world because it's cheap. And it's sort of like the little fish that eat the big fish because when you get millions of these players together, they're much more agile than those big, giant, kind of bulky, big data companies like Microsoft, Apple, Facebook. What they tried to do is take a 20th century vertically integrated model for a second industrial revolution platform that was designed to be centralized and top down and graft it onto an engineering platform that's designed to be transparent, open, and laterally scaled. And you want to keep it open because you want the network effect, right? Here we are in the communication center here, right? So what's interesting is what I'm going to tell you, the newest thing on the horizon are edge data centers. How many have heard of edge data centers? Three or four or five, yeah. So what's happening is we are beginning to democratize the big data. And every building in the new era is going to be retrofitted for climate resiliency. And then it becomes an edge data center, a micropower generation site for solar and geothermal and even wind. Every building becomes a charging station for storing your energy and for powering your electric vehicle. The reason we're doing these edge data centers, I'll give you just one example. If we send information data to the cloud to manage your autonomous vehicles, forget it. Everyone's going to be crashing because it takes too long. So the edge data centers allow you, wherever you are, to have your own data center and connect with each other locally so there's no latency period and you can immediately respond. So the technology actually rewards a very distributed framework for how people organize their life. That's what's coming. It's already starting. That's the upside, a vast potential expansion of social entrepreneurialism in SMEs and cooperatives around the world. Now there's a downside. The dark net's as impressive as the bright net, and we're going to have to spend as much time and energy and political resources on this as we do trying to get to the promised land here. How do we protect network neutrality when everyone's connected? How do we ensure governments don't purloin this Internet of Things, which will connect the human race? We see ourselves as a species now. I mean, remember, our young people are Skyping in global classrooms. At any given day, there's millions of them all over the world playing games and sports together. They're doing all sorts of stuff there. Facebook's the largest fictional family in history, although they're getting off Facebook, which is good. So what I'm saying is the dark net is, is impressive, too. How do you prevent, how do you prevent countries from going into other nations 
and undermining their elections and hacking them. This is already happening. How do you ensure that big internet companies and telecom companies don't commodify our data 24-7 and then destroy our personal agency because they control our personal experiences through our lifetime? That's already happening. How do we protect privacy, data security? How do we prevent cyber terrorism? This is really very, very heady stuff. In the European Union, where I work, we're taking those you know, first steps more than anyone else. Uh, we're, gonna, we're looking at antitrust. These are going to be broken up. I said that five or six years ago. Some people said, you're crazy. They're going to be broken up. But more importantly, the new technology is going to reward a much more flat, lateral, distributed kind of playing field with SMEs and cooperatives. We see them forming. Why would you need, for example, why would you need Uber? So if you've got a car, you're the driver, it's your labor, it's your insurance, it's your vehicle, and you're giving money to Uber so they can connect you to a website, well, now a younger generation of Gen Z say, anybody can put up these websites. We'll form cooperatives. They're democratically run. We'll manage all of the economic activity internally and not send money back to Goldman Sachs. And we'll keep it in the local community. And this is happening because with all the edge data centers and the new possibilities on software, it's cheaper, it's more agile, it works. We're going to look back at those big companies, telecom, especially internet companies in 20 years from now, if we make it, say, well, those were kind of weird, kind of clanky old institutions. We're going to have to uh, deal with the dark net, but let me say what the possibilities are of the bright net. Let's say you're a small and medium-sized enterprise here in Toronto. You can go up on this emerging internet of things right now, and you can get a transparent picture of a lot of the data coming through because it's free, most of it then you can mine the data you care about for your value chain, for your business, with your own analytics. Create your own algorithms and apps. So you can dramatically increase your aggregate efficiency at every single conversion across your business, and by doing that, dramatically increase your generativity, reduce your carbon footprint because you're using less of the earth and getting more out of each conversion, and you plunge your fixed and marginal cost. In fact, what's happened with this digital revolution is thrown capitalism for, um, it's really thrown capitalism a curve. We used to teach that marginal cost is the optimum market. You want to sell at marginal cost because then you have cheap products, you can get a lot of people to buy them, you can put some um, uh, nice uh, profits back to your investors. It's just we never expected a revolution, the digital revolution, so powerful that it could reduce marginal costs very low and then market capitalism doesn't work. You don't have the profits. Markets are too slow. Sellers and buyers come together, there's a transaction, then they leave. And in the downtime, you have overhead costs, you have advertising, you have employees to pay, you have pension funds. So what's happening, when you get to low marginal costs, you have to move from markets to networks, from ownership to access, from sellers and buyers to provider user networks from consumerism to sustainability, from externalities to circularity, from GDP to quality of life. This is a complete transaction, because when profits get really low, the only way you make money is by a constant flow in networks 24-7 as a service, but there's no sellers and buyers here, just providers and users. That's already happening in businesses around the world. And some of the margins are getting so low, they've gone to near zero and created the sharing economy. We now have millions of young people right now, this tonight, who are producing their own music, their own YouTube videos, their own social media, and they're sharing them all over the world. All you need is a little digital recorder, and whether you send that to one person or a billion, it's zero marginal cost. You just need a service provider and power up. We have young people that are sharing uh, massive open online college courses taught by the best professors. They're getting college credits. There's a big dropout rate, but it's not going away. And then there's Wikipedia fifth largest website in the world, and if you eliminate the porno websites, I'm sure it's number one. It's the top website in the world, I think. It's all nonprofit, run by $50 million of donations by people like us, and we've totally democratized education in 50 years because of Jimmy Wales' little experiment. Apparently, people have nothing else to do because <laughs> me, I put something up there in the ether, and then within an hour, they're crawling all over the lines, all over the sentences, this is wrong, where's your footnote, I disagree, and the checks work. We democratize education in less than 15 years, and we think, oh, well, no big deal. It's a big deal. 
This is part of the democratization I'm talking about that's going to extend everywhere. Well, it's true that we had this first generation of Facebook, Apple, Google, and Twitter, but they're going to be gone, I think, in a pretty soon. But we didn't, we didn't really think that this would move from the world of bits to the world of things, the physical world. The Internet of Things broke the wall. We now have millions of people producing their own solar and wind. And guess what? The marginal cost? In Europe, the sun hasn't sent us a bill. And the wind has not invoiced us. It's free. And the fixed costs are plunging. We'll get back to that. We have millions of young people in car sharing services. And the new studies that we have in the book from internal in the, in the industry suggest that the marginal cost of transport and autonomous electric vehicles without any labor and with sun and wind free are going to move towards zero. And they're going to commodify your experience in the car while you're hanging out. So let's go back to Germany. What's happened there since the first conversation? Germany now, 35% of its electricity is renewable. It'll be, uh, I'm sorry, it's 45%, excuse me. It'll be 60%, I believe, by 2030, 65%. And um, what's interesting is the fixed cost. The fixed costs have been plunging on an exponential curve. Now, exponential curves are kind of strange. Uh, I grew up, I'm, I'm a World War II baby. We didn't have any computers. The first computer was at my school, uh, the University of Pennsylvania. It's called the UNIVAC. And at the time we, the first computers came online, the chairman of IBM predicted that we would need, I want the young people to hear this, we would need five computers for the world. <laughs> five. And that was an optimistic forecast. What they didn't anticipate was Intel's engineers who began in the 1970s to double the capacity on those chips every two years. And now smartphone, $25. What's happened is solar and wind have been on the same exponential curves, but these curves are very, it's hard. You don't see them at first. If you double a dollar every day, if I said to you, I'll give you a dollar and double it every day, or I'll give you a million dollars for 30 days, I'll double it every day or give you a million, what would you take? Probably a million. Well, guess what? You'd be wrong. 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512. Man, nothing's going on here. Wait till you get to the last eight. <laughs> Through the roof. So what's happened is a fixed watt of solar in the late 70s cost about $78. Fixed fall cost. You know what the fixed cost is tonight? 43 cents. 35 cents in 18 months from now. We have power and utility companies in Europe and America quietly in the last 12 months buying 20-year contracts for solar and wind, 5 cents, 4 cents, 3 cents, 2 cents a kilowatt hour. And here's what you don't know. I'm with the electric utilities all over the world every week, every month, hopefully not every week. But what's happening is panic in the boardroom. Because what's happening to them is what happened to the music industry and publishing and newspapers. The big disruption is here. Back in 2015, Citigroup, Citibank, the big bank, they saw it coming, and they said, oh my gosh. They didn't say that. They said, it looks like we have $100 trillion now in potential stranded assets in the fossil fuel industry around the world. Did you hear that figure? $100 trillion. And the reason is the costs are plummeting. So guess what happened in 2019? The levelized cost of utility scale solar and wind just plunge below natural gas. Way below nuclear, way below oil, way below coal. It just plunged below natural gas. And that means we have trillions, tens of trillions, maybe $100 trillion of stranded assets. All the exploration rights in the oil companies that will never be used because they'll never amortize them out. All of the fossil fuels under the ground on the ocean floor that we will never take out because they're too expensive. They're stranded. All of the pipelines that will be abandoned, all of the refineries that will not be used, all the power plants that we're still putting online across Canada that we'll never amortize because we're using them very little, and within a year or two, we won't use them at all. The market is speaking. And the market didn't do this alone. We did this in the EU when we introduced the 2020-20 formula. Increase your aggregate efficiency by 20%, reduce your global warming by 20%, increase your solar and wind by 20%. That allowed us in Europe to get millions of small players, cooperatives, families, farmers, neighborhood associations, businesses, all created co-ops. They went to the banks. They got the money. They got a premium for their energy. And now the price is so cheap, we don't even need the premiums anymore. Whereas nuclear and fossil fuels, they're still getting billions of dollars of subsidies, and they're dying out. So 
what's interesting here is that the fixed costs are plummeting, and now the fossil fuel industry is collapsing. Well, listen to this. $11 trillion have exited the fossil fuel complex in the last four years. Isn't that astounding? This is a stampede. And what's, the reason they're doing that, they're being led by public pension funds. And the reason is, what we saw a few years ago is when the coal became uncompetitive in the U.S. because natural gas was cheaper and then solar and wind became cheaper than natural gas. All the coal industry went bankrupt in the last four years in the U.S. And guess what? They stranded all of those assets in bankruptcy and none of the workers got their pension funds. Pension funds are the largest capital in the pool in the world. Karl Marx would be flipping in his grave. He never saw this. 41 trillion, the workers of the world, hundreds of millions of workers, their pension funds are the major capital investment tool in the world. And the big public pension funds in New York City and London, all over the world, the big cities have gotten out in the last two years because they don't want to see their public employees stranded because their deferred wa wages, which are supposed to be invested for their retirement, this is their money, gone. They're getting out. It is a stampede. Where does this take us? All of these uh, trillions of dollars that are coming out of the industry, they are desperate to invest in the third industrial revolution infrastructure because they need big scale deployment because there's so much money sitting here, liquid, it's not going anywhere. The only way you could invest this kind of money would be in a massive infrastructure transition to bring in the communication internet with the energy internet, the mobility internet, retrofit all the buildings, turn them into IoT. But here's the problem. It's not the money. We don't even need new taxes here. There are 9,000 cities who have signed up for the Global Covenant of Mayors for the Climate Accords of the Paris Climate Talks. And if you went and talked to any of those mayors, they will show you their beautiful, shiny, 10 electric buses. Their 15 lead buildings. Their new bicycle paths and scooter paths. They're all tiny little pilots. And so what we need to do is begin to scale up and deploy in every region a powerful third industrial revolution infrastructure to make this happen. The problem here is sometimes we don't see the handwriting on the wall. Let me give you an example. Let's go back to Germany. There are four major power companies in Germany, MBW, RWE, Eon, and Vattenfall. And what they didn't see coming, there's a rule of thumb that economists don't tend to follow, but investors know. And that is, it isn't how powerful an incumbent is in terms of the market they control. It's how fast the challenger is coming into the market. When electricity came on to challenge gas lighting, when electricity got to 3% of the market, it was over. Because it was growing so fast, the investment community said, this is gone. What they didn't see in Germany, because I was there, is that when electricity, when 14% of the electricity in Germany became solar and wind, that was the inflection point. 300 billion in losses just between 2010 and 2015 is much bigger now. 14% is the inflection point for electricity. The United States will, is well, bless you, 18%, I'm sorry, 8%, it'll be 14% of its electricity in 2023, over. Globally, the whole world would be 14% of the electricity, solar and wind by 2028, over. The market's too powerful here, even though government set this up, then it had created the possibility for new innovations. People got it cheaper, and now the market is speaking. But now we need to deploy it. Does this mean that this is the end of the communication, energy, mobility, fossil fuel complex? Not necessarily, but they have to change their model. The ICT and telecom companies, I will tell you, they are changing quickly. Google, Facebook, Amazon, um, Google, Facebook, and Apple are off-grid 100%. All the new data centers are renewable. Basically, it's a good business proposition. They don't want to be strand, have stranded assets in 30 years from now, and they want security for their data centers. What's interesting is energy now, the electric utilities are moving out. Does anyone think that they should stay where they are? I know. You're saying to yourself, then why are we building gas pipelines and tar sands, and British Columbia's got gas pipelines moving out to Asia? What is going on here? It's crazy. The leading fossil fuel power in the world is the United States, number one. Canada's number four. But you hide. At least President Trump, he's very upfront about it. We, we just want fossil fuels. But when we come to Canada, 
the line is, we are the climate people. We want to have climate dealt with. We want to get out of fossil fuels. But your government, I have to say, will take every opportunity to sign those permits for those pipelines. You're digging yourself deeper and deeper into the hole. At some point, you have to realize you're not going to get out. Watch the U.S., watch Canada, and watch all the countries that are reliant on fossil fuels. And you'll see what's happening. They are going to be in real trouble in the next two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten years. Does this mean the end of the electricity companies? Not necessarily, but they have to change their business model. So back in 2009, I think it was, E.ON, the big power company in Germany, they, they asked if I would debate their president, Mr. Tyson. He's still there. I said, you're not going to leave the second industrial revolution tomorrow, but the disruption is going to come in the next two or three years. And if you're not there doing the disruption with a new business model, you're gone. The transition's 20 years, but the disruption's two. And I said, in this third industrial revolution, you make money by not generating any electricity. Millions of people are producing it, pretty soon hundreds of millions, pretty soon everybody. You know they're putting solar uh, panels, they're, they're putting photovoltaic in paint and glass and facades. Everyone's going to be producing energy all over the world but they're going to have to share it between the surpluses and the lulls across continents because everybody doesn't have the same that it's at any given time. So I said to Ian, you're not going to generate any new power from, renew from renewables. First of all, you can't scale it. You could scale fossil fuels and uranium because they are only found in a few places and they require a lot of money and you can vertically integrate. And by the way, you have to weaponize the whole world to secure them. Be mindful, we fought two world wars over coal in the Ruhr Valley between France and Germany and oil in the Bosphorus. Well, millions of people have died. They're still dying in the Middle East right now because of fossil fuels. So I said, you're not going to generate the new energies because they're everywhere. How are you going to control every rooftop, every house, every landscape? No matter how greedy you might be, you can't scale it. It's too distributed. It's go back to distributed. It's everywhere. You have to collect it everywhere and then create an energy internet so you share it. So I said, also, you're going to make more money by selling less electricity. You won't generate and you sell less. He said, I'm lost. I'm not generating and I'm selling less. I said, what you're going to do is set up partnerships with thousands of businesses if you want to survive. You'll help manage the energy going through their value systems. You will help them with their big data and analytics so you can, at every step of conversion on their business value chain, supply chains, production, you can help them increase their aggregate efficiency with analytics, reduce their fixed and marginal cost, and they'll share those gains back with you in performance contracts. He didn't do it. He waited too long. And two and a half years ago, he put his fossil fuel and nuclear power on the market. There's no bidders. It's stranded. All four power companies have used the models that our office introduced and is now moving across Europe and now here in the United States, not yet in Canada. The coming together the communication internet with the energy internet gives rise. Oh, let me say one more thing. It's not just Europe. China. I had never worked in China. I had never been in China. I knew very little about China. This is kind of serendipitous, too. So when, when President Xi and Premier Li came in to office, Premier Li, they put out their biographies. They had never done that before. And they said up front, Premier Li said he had read the Third Industrial Revolution book. I thought it was a joke at first, honestly. <laughs> and he had instructed the central government to move on the narratives I'm sharing with you tonight here in Toronto. And boy, they move fast. I've had four official visits with the leadership working with them. And after 11 weeks after the first visit, they announced $80 billion to completely digitize the state grid, which is the biggest grid in China and the world, so that millions of Chinese people could buy solar and wind from their own companies, because now they're the largest producers of cheap solar and wind, and share what they're not using back on a digitized energy internet. Smart. This is the 13th five-year plan already on, on board. Watch Europe, watch China. Watch the United States, California, New York, Texas. You've heard about the wind in Texas. Our group did that with Texas. We got them out of nuclear power with a billion dollar loss, got them into wind. And now ranchers across Texas are staying on their ranches because of the money they're making on their wind turbines. Now it's spread across into the Plain states in the Midwest. So when President Trump says, I don't like windmills, they cause cancer, I don't think he understands when he goes into these areas what the reaction is going to be. He's just doesn't understand the situation. So the coming together of the communication internet with the energy internet makes possible the mobility and logistics internet. 
We built the whole world on making and selling cars in the 20th century, correct? And everything that went with it, uh, interstate highways, suburban rollout, tra travel and tourism, shopping centers, theme parks, the whole works. The problem is the millennials and Gen Zs. And not very many here. How many here are, are Gen Zs? How many millennials? You are the problem. <laughs> Apparently, you look down on owning automobiles. You probably can't afford them, but you also look down on them. Because you would prefer access, instant access, to car sharing mobility rather than owning a car that sits in the driveway and you have to wax it once a month or it's sitting at the office and you're only using it for an hour. And beginning with your generation, we know in the transport industry, I work with them, that you're not going to own cars again. It's over. For every car you're sharing, we are eliminating 10 to 15 cars. Every major automobile transport company knows this. We have 1.2 billion automobiles, trucks, buses in the world. They're choking us in traffic. They're the number three cause of climate change. Number one is buildings. By the way, anyone know what number two is? What kind of agriculture? Yeah, a little louder. Well, in cows. Cows, cows, yeah, and industrial agriculture. So nobody wants to talk about that. Uh, I wrote a book called Beyond Beef in 1990. Even the environmental groups would not support it. I love cows. My wife and I are animal rights activists. We love cows. They're wonderful animals. <laughs> they have better manners than we do. We've got 1.3 billion cows. They take up 27% of the ice-free land mass of the world. If you would come here from another planet, you might think they're the dominant species. They really do inhabit this planet. <laughs> now, the methane they produce is 24, 23 times more potent than CO2 molecules. And the feces, the nitrous oxide in their feces is 288 times more potent. And this is kind of interesting, just as an aside, and I'll get to transport. We have learned in this year the new studies coming out of the scientific community, and they're really devastating. We've lost 60% of the topsoil in the world now. It takes 1,000 years to get an inch of topsoil back. Here's the interesting part of it. Half of all the remaining agricultural world, land in the world today is growing feed grain for cows, mainly. We're not going to have a choice. So if people say, oh, I don't want to change my diet, we'll have no choice. Either you free up that half that's feed grain for animals for a small percentage of the population, or people starve to death. Let's go back to transport. The car companies and the transport companies are moving to mobility and logistic networks, all right? and car sharing services. This is happening all over the place. And I'm going to give you a really cool example, Daimler. Daimler created the internal combustion engine, Daimler Benz. Uh, a few years ago, Wolfgang Bernhard, who was the chairman of Daimler Trucks, asked me to join him in Germany. They were bringing in 300 journalists from around the world to introduce their mobility internet. And when I got there, I laid out the narrative. And then Wolfgang got up, and he said, well, we're in a new business, mobility and logistics internet. He said, we've been quietly outfitting 300,000 Daimler trucks with sensors all over the outside of the trucks. And they're now all on expressways in Europe, and they're picking up data on traven conditions, weather flows, moment-to-moment uh, -moment warehouse availability as the trucks come in and out. And they're using those logistics so they can then share them with thousands of clients in order to increase their efficiencies, reduce their deadheading, so they have better performance. Then this is very, really interesting. He went to a real-time uh, helicopter feed. You can see this in the film, Third Industrial Revolution film. And they had uh, three Daimler trucks on the German expressways, and the helicopter zooming down on the trucks, and Wolfgang goes into the trucks, and we're all waving at the drivers. And he says to the drivers, take your hand off the wheel. Take your feet off the pedal. Put the screen on the dashboard. They were retrained as software analysts. The trucks started to run by themselves, and they platooned into a train-like mobile data center off the German expressways. Smart, huh? Smart. Here's where the inflection point's reaching in mobility. And this I want you to hear. I mentioned energy. Now let's look at mobility. And all of what I'm saying tonight, those st these are all not my wild imagination. All of the studies in the book are from the last 12 months, the Green New Deal. I think they're all getting a book here. Thank you, Eddie. I'm getting a book here. Everybody's getting a book. But uh, yeah, you can applaud. <laughs> so in the book, all the studies are from the financial community, the banking community, the transport industry, the electric utility industry, the consulting industries. 
all from the last 12 months. This is all happening behind the scenes, all right? So only 2% of the vehicles in the world today are EVs, electric vehicles. But by 2023, this is Bloomberg uh, Energy Business, the transport. By 2023, they'll be competitive with no subsidies to internal combustion vehicles. By 2026, they'll be cheaper. By 2028, 20% 20 of the vehicles in the world will be electric vehicles. This is across all the studies. And when that happens, that's the inflection point. Remember I said 14% of the electricity, solar and wind, it's over, massive stranded assets, 20% for transport and mobility. How serious is this? Volkswagen always competes with Toyota to be the biggest car company in the world. I think they're number one right now. So Volkswagen has just announced that they're putting out the last internal combustion platform in all of history in 2026. It's over, the last one. And they have just announced 80 billion euro commitment to bring EVs on. 80 billion, that's one company. And they're projecting 22 million EV sales in their company, one-fourth of global production by 2028. And they join with Bechtel, and they're putting in 35,000 charging stations in the next three years. Does this sound serious to you? Other companies are doing the same. It's moving very, very quickly. But again, while the market is speaking, the market doesn't create the infrastructure that puts all of this together. That's the responsibility of government at the local level, the regional level, and the national level. Businesses could not set up the interstate highway system. They could put out the cars, but not the interstate highway system. And businesses could not set up a national electricity grids. So why is this important? We consume 93 million barrels of oil a day in the world, 93 million barrels. Two-thirds of it goes to transport. That's why the subtitle of the book is Why the Fossil Fuel Civilization Will Collapse by 2028 and a bold economic plan to save life on Earth. The plan's emerging. But without the localities and cities and regions, it won't happen. Now, some of you read the editorial that I did in the Globe Mail this week. The problem is this. In the EU, we learn by, uh, by experience and by failures, really. National governments will not create this infrastructure alone. What Chancellor Merkel said to me the first night, at the, at the end of the evening, she said, I like this distributed, open, laterally scaled infrastructure revolution for Germany. And I said, why? She said, you have to understand Germany. We are a federal republic. The 16 regions control their infrastructure. They deploy it, and we align them, create the codes, regulations, and standards, and the carrots and sticks. That's it. The U.S. is a federal republic. You, your regions here, your provinces control. But this is true all over the world. So when we introduce Smart Europe, that I worked with with the European Union. I think you've got the pamphlet there we just did for the European Investment Bank on our plan, I think. Uh, we saw that the 28 member states, hopefully we'll keep 28, hope the Brits will wake up from their crazy <laughs> craziness. Uh, we saw that the European Union and the nation states will create the codes, regulations, and standards, but the 350 regions will deploy. In my country, we have all these Democratic presidential candidates talking about the federal government's going to do a new deal, all right? But that was based on a second industrial revolution centralized platform for the federal government set up the big dams and they put in all of the, the, the big operations you need and the government hired everybody. The third industrial revolution is different because everybody's the infrastructure. Sure, we need a national power grid. That's going to be the federal government. But if you own a solar panel, you're part of the infrastructure. If you have a geothermal heat pump, you're part of the infrastructure. If you have an edge data center, you're part of the infrastructure. If you have a charging station for your EV, if you have an EV, you're part of the infrastructure. So millions of people and businesses and communities are part of the infrastructure. It is totally distributed. You can go on, you can go off, you can re-engineer uh, re it with microgrids so you can share it in any way you like. So even though all the Democratic candidates are talking about the federal government this or that, I try to remind them in my country that 93% of the infrastructure is owned by the states. It can't be that dumb. And 75% of the improvements are the states. So the federal government in our country, and same here, you, they provide the codes, the regulations, the standards, the carrots, the sticks, some mandates. But your provinces and territories have to set this up. So how do we do this? Where's the money? The money, you don't even need new taxes here in Canada. You don't have to go into big uh, new taxes to do this or re, 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 re look at budget priorities. 
you've got so much capital in your pension funds and other institutional funds and other investment um, managed funds that are just waiting and they're willing to take low returns that are steady over 20 years for infrastructure because they'll assure that they'll have retirement for their workers. Do you follow me? And they know that the market can't do that for them. It's too crazy. So the way we've learned our lessons in Europe is this. What we realized is that regions can do this, but they have to do this in a new way. With climate change, What's happening here is we're never going to go back to where we were. I don't want you to leave here and think I'm telling you that we can do all this and go back. It's going to get worse and worse and worse, I'm telling you. We are in a rewilding event. There's nothing we're going to do to mitigate and stop it, but what we can is slow it down so we can adapt and hopefully survive and flourish in new ways that we don't even have a playbook for tonight, all right? What we learned in climate disasters that are more and more frequent is something very interesting. It's changing the governance pattern. This is really interesting. We didn't see it coming. Just like we didn't see the technology coming in the marketplace. How many of you have been in a, in a disaster, climate disaster? Either a flood, a drought, a wildfire? Okay. So what happens in these disasters, I've been in one hurricane. Uh, it wasn't terrible. but In these disasters, no government can handle this on their own. No ministry can handle it on their own. So what happens is the whole community comes out. The neighborhood associations, the schools come out, the NGOs come out, the local business community. And this is where the best of the empathic uh, spirit, which is in our neural circuitry, this is we're born with this, comes out. People risking their lives for other people, for their pets, for their homes, helping each other out. This is our real intrinsic nature is the empathic response. The secondary qualities are culturally designed whether it be for brutality or for self-interest, but our primary circuitry is for empathy. So in climate disasters, the whole community comes out. What's happening is these climate disasters are becoming everyday occurrences and not once every 20 years. So in the floodplains, for example, in our mid part of our country, the first, the spring floods come, they go, they still haven't rebuilt, and then they come again. So what's happening now in these areas around the world is that between these events, People continue to work with the local government to learn and adapt with each other, and they're becoming more and more peer assemblies ad hoc. Now we're formalizing it because they realize you need the whole community engaged at all times if you're moving to an age of resilience where you have to deal with a rewilding planet that's unpredictable moment to moment and much more a normal occurrence, right? In Europe, we took this model. So we're in three test regions right now. Halte de France, which is the industrial rust belt of France, the coal mining region, still the major auto region, the steel region, we're in our sixth year there. Uh, the 23 cities, Rotterdam to The Hague, the petrochemical region of Europe, and Luxembourg, one of the two financial capitals. How to France, they came to us, they came to me, the president, many years ago and said, will you do a plan for us? And I said, absolutely not. He said, well, why wouldn't you? And I said, because it'll sit on a shelf in some minister's office and you'll do another pilot and we're moving to extinction. It's a waste of time. I said, but if you want to go back to the region and get every mayor across every political party on board, every uh, chamber of commerce, every economic development corporation, every labor union, every university, every high school, come back. I never thought he'd come back, frankly, you know, as a kiss off. <laughs> this guy was fairly tenacious, President Peshon. He came back. He said, well, I did it. And I said, we still won't do it. <laughs> and I, no, I was very serious. And I said, the reason we won't do it is because you can't have ministers do something of this magnitude. If you want to put together a peer assembly, thousands of people giving inputs, at least 300 people for 10 months working day in and day out after work with our global team from the areas of industry, labor, universities, research, you'll create the plan. We give you the architecture, communication, energy, mobility, logistics. We'll help you with technical. You create the plan. This is not a focus group. This is not a stakeholder group. They're total BS. I can tell you that. You just get a little input and say the community's on our side. They did the plan in 10 months. And if you took these roadmap plans are up on our website. So, uh, the ones for the Netherlands, uh, um, these plans average about 500 pages. All the most complex, interrelated, integrated plans you'll ever see beyond any consulting industry that could ever do it. The people came together at every level to do this. We're in our sixth year. They got the award as the number one uh, entrepreneurial region in Europe by the Committee of the Regions, and three years in, 
They've created 1,200 projects. They've taken the coal mining region and they've, they've trained the grandchildren of coal miners. They're retrofitting and solarizing and they've got jobs all over the place, clean, healthy, and making a living. They're putting in the autonomous vehicles. They're putting in the smart roads. They're putting in the new tech parks to find biological substitutes for petrochemical products. And now they're beginning to ratchet up for the big scale. If they can do that, why can't every province and city in Canada do that? There's nothing special about these people. We need to move toward deployment of roadmaps in all of the provinces in Canada and show what this is all about. Because underneath this exterior of fossil fuels, there is a deeper cultural DNA in this country. I know about this. I have friends in Canada. I've been here many times. That older cultural DNA is a love of nature, a love of the environment, a love of, of being in a country as beautiful as this. And you are outdoor people. That's the older cultural DNA. Now you've got to step forward. And what I'm saying to the young people that are on the streets, if you think you're going to get this done just by protesting the government, which you should do, keep it, pro keep it militant, keep it nonviolent, and put the pressure on. But if you think the existing generation of political leaders are going to do this for you who are over 40, you are kidding yourself. It's not that they're bad people, but they will say, you will say to them, a 20-year-old will say to an elected officials, we've got to deal with a climate emergency. We need a Green New Deal. And the elected official will say, you're right. We consider this one of the key priorities. <laughs> yeah. And they, the young people say, how could this be one of the key priorities? How could extinction be one of many priorities? What other priorities could there be on that level? I'm serious. I hear this all the time. AOC, that young congresswoman, youngest woman in Congress, we need millions of AOCs. Millions who will go into political life right now. Once you're 21, is that the, ele elect the age? When can you run for officer? 25? They can vote at 18, 19. Get in there. Move forward. This is a, a generation of digital natives. Now, many of you are parents and grandparents here. Talk to your, your young people. You got a free book here. Take it home and give it to your young people. Because there are other jobs. Every industry will be involved in the infrastructure, and it's millions of jobs. Robots and AI do not retrofit buildings. Robots and AI don't lay down underground cable. Robots and AI don't put solar panels or wind turbines up. Now, I wrote a book on automation, The End of Work. Some of you may remember back in the mid-'90s. We are moving to an automated world. But, uh, but what we see is we have one last surge of mass wage labor to lay out this system. Robots and AI won't do it. And once it's laid out, it's going to run by very small workforces. Good. Get rid of it. Why should we be doing all of this tedious work? We know where the, move, the work's going to go, and I said this in 95. The work's going to go to the social economy, the nonprofit sector, because that's where machines are only supplemental. You'll never have a robot preparing a two-year-old in a child care center to be a human being. I guarantee it won't happen. The robot will bring the orange juice to them. Big deal. <laughs> and if you're so lazy you need the robot to do that, fine. But robots and AI, they are not going to address the question of how you adapt to climate change. It's too complicated. It requires that adaptive skills. Now, you know in Star Trek you have Spock, but then Captain Kirk always intervenes in the end because the adaptive motive sometimes is, is more important. You need the rational, but you need the adaptive. So there's so many things that require the nonprofit social economy. In my country, California is 15% of the employment. 10% nationally. I don't know what it is in Canada. In Europe, it's around 14%. And it's the fastest growing sector. So we are going to automate the, the economy. And so when we look back at this, maybe uh, Alfred, North Kane, uh, Alfred uh, Keynes got it right. Keynes said, great economist, he wrote a little five-pager to his grandchildren at the height of the Depression in 1932. And he said, you're hearing about automation. People are scared about their jobs. This is a good thing. Let the machines do all the work we don't need to do. It's tedious so that we can get on with something more in life. And with climate change, we're going to have to be freed. You know why all the jobs are going to go to the social economy? It's going to require in every community jobs with employment to deal with disasters and adapting between the disasters, the public health issues, uh, the cultural issues, the environmental issues, the educational issues. That's going to be done in that sector. Last thought. I don't think it's just about technology. Some of you know that I am not a utopian on technology. I've been critical of a lot of technologies over the last 40 years. 
I don't think just because it can be done we're going to go to paradise. We have the technology, the market speaking. There's trillions of dollars that, want it, that are getting out and they're looking to scale. So there is no excuse. But unless there's a change in consciousness in one generation, we will not get there just with the technology. I'm only guardedly hopeful because I'm sensing a change in consciousness among millennial and Gen Z generations. So in a good sense, the parents have done a good job from the baby boomers. And what I'm sensing is this. I grew up in a geopolitical world. In a geopolitical world, every nation is sovereign, every citizen every nation is sovereign, and every citizen competes with every other citizen for scarce resources in a zero-sum game. Every government competes with every other government in the marketplace and often in the battlefield for the same. Can anyone here tell me how we can address climate change, bring the human family together, and find a new path to live peacefully on this planet with a geopolitical frame of reference? No. We've got young people coming home with biosphere consciousness. The biosphere is 19 kilometers from the stratosphere to the lithosphere and the water where the entire planet interacts with life. We've got young people coming home and saying to their dad, why are you using so much water while you're shaving? The next province here, fire, droughts. Or this one, which I know will turn off a lot of people. Why in Arizona are you golfing on a golf course that's using all that water in a desert? I usually use half the crowd in corporate settings on this, but that's all right. They'll think about it the next time they step on the lawn and grass. And the young people are saying, why is that TV on in the next room? We haven't been in there for three weeks. Do we need the background noise? And why two cars? Why not at least car share one, get rid of the other one? And the one that I'm particularly fond of, where did the, where'd the beef and the hamburger come from? Let me revisit that in the last moment. Do you remember when President Macron in September said to the president of Brazil, he said, please stop the fires, 70,000 fires. You're burning the Amazon. It's the lungs of the planet. What Macron was sort of intuitively getting to is a biosphere is our indisputable community. So what was the response of the president of Brazil? This is our sovereign territory. We are seeing a generational shift. I don't think Macron is quite there, but young people are seeing the biosphere. They're, the biosphere does not honor boundaries. The lithosphere, the hydrosphere, the atmosphere, the biosphere, the magnetosphere, they don't honor the boundaries. And climate change doesn't honor the boundaries. And the sun and the wind do not honor the boundaries. So then in the new world of peer assembly governance, the real demarcations are going to be the 19 kilometers of the biosphere that every community is responsible for, where they live, where they work, where they exist. That's the only way we're going to address it. And then we work across the world in these interwoven uh, internets so that we can share best practices, share energy, share our mobility, and other things. We have to be relatively self-sufficient. Gandhi got it right in his concentric circles. He just didn't have the technology. Whatever you do, you've got to be self-sufficient as much as you can, but then you rely on others. We're a social creature. We rely on others as well. So our young people are saying, did that hamburger come from the Amazon? What Macron never asked, why are they burning those trees down? He never asked. They're burning them down to graze a cow on six inches of topsoil for one hamburger on the French plate, or not hamburger, one beef on the French plate. He would never do it. Young people have to do that. And when they burn the trees, there are wild uh, they're species that only live in that particular canopy in the world. They're extinct. We never hear them. We never see them again. We haven't even identified them yet. And when those trees are burned down for that six inches of topsoil for the hamburger, the piece of steak on that French table, those trees aren't there to absorb CO2 from global warming emissions from industrial activity. So some farmer can't feed her children in rural India because she's getting spring floods, summer droughts, and wildfires because of that beef steak on the Parisian plate. It could be anywhere in the world. I'm just not picking on France. This is everywhere. So I'm guardedly hopeful here that a young generation is moving forward. But what I will say to you tonight, I really think this path is short. And for all of the student strikes and all the young people going on the streets, this is going to have to be much more tenacious. We're going to have to dedicate every moment of our lives, grandparents, parents, children, grandchildren, in every community toward this end. If we're not willing to do that, there's no guarantee. 99.9% .9 of all the species that have been on this little planet have come and gone. This is a defining moment. And for God's sake, Canada should be leading the Americas here. 
I get so upset when I come up here and see them still putting in those gas pipelines and putting in the new permits and putting in the new power plants. If the government leaders can't wake up, everyone in the regions have to wake up. Because if you wait until next year or wait for someone else to do it, we're not going to make it in time. So I'm hoping when you leave here tonight, it's not a matter of, you know, an interesting talk. I know most of you are already the true believers. You've got to go out and talk to neighbors you won't normally talk to, <laughs> okay? And you've got to go out in those communities and get involved in the neighborhood associations. And you've got to go out there and get people on the school boards and get them in the, uh, the nonprofit organizations and get them elected to local office. We've got to move this not just during elections, but day in and day out. Because if you think it's just about who you elect on the national government every four years, you're mistaken about what we have to do. We can make this, and I'll leave with the last thought of hope. I'm never optimistic or pessimistic. I'm always guardedly hopeful, that's all. We laid down the entire first industrial revolution in the United States between 1860 and 1890. We put a continental railroad across the country in the frontier. We laid out telegraph system across the United States. We put in land-grant universities to train a new workforce. We had a homesteading act that gave millions of acres of land, one-third of the country, to people to build their homes. We did that in 30 years. You were comparable in your time frame here in Canada, all right, with the Intercontinental Railroad and all of the other. We laid out the second industrial revolution in the United States between 1908, the first Model T, and 1932, the Depression, 25 years, urban areas. We got the urban areas electrified. We put in the telephones. We put in the road systems. We put in the gasoline stations. We did all that in the urban areas, at least, in 25 years. The world took a little longer, and then it was completed in the 50s. The third industrial revolution can happen in 20 by building off the first industrial revolution and the second that are still here and we have to change them. So I don't want anyone to tell me that this can't be done in 20 years. The money is there, the technology is ripe, the market is speaking, and now it's just the will to make the transformation. We are moving from the age of progress, that's over. We're moving to the age of resilience, that's here. Will we be resilient? So I'm hoping tomorrow morning, raise hell here in Toronto. Thank you. I hope you're applauding for yourself, because that's what you need to do. Well, not that I want to invoke fire metaphors, but that was something of a barn burner. Um, I, I imagine you're somewhat depleted. Never ask a 74-year-old <laughs> man if you're somewhat depleted. <laughs> uh, and I'm cognizant of the time. But, but maybe what we could do is take uh, three questions. So if there are, th oh, that was fast. And I will, I'll run the mic to the people in question. Or Ennis has one as well. Thank you. You're going to hold, okay, yeah, you hold it. Yeah, right. it. Thank you. Okay. So I just came back from five weeks in Egypt, and I've never seen so much pollution in my life. It was unbelievable. And my first thought, which continued for the full five weeks, amplified by every day, was why aren't people over there telling them that? Because they know they've all got phones, they've all got brand new cars, all those cars are on the road 24 hours a day. It's not poverty. It's something else. It depends on the country. For example, there was no action in China. Now there is. There was nothing going on in India. When we first came in, they asked them to do a plan for them. It was about 15 years ago, 10 years, nothing going on. Now it is. Because the people are dying. They can't breathe. The asthma is now killing people. This is really bad. So China and India are starting to move. What's interesting is two-thirds of all the new solar and wind in the world last year was in the developing countries. Did you hear that? They're on fire. And why? We, didn't, uh, we finally understood something about development that we never really paid any attention to. In the developing countries, their liability is their asset. Their liability is they don't have any infrastructure. That's an asset because it's cheaper and easier to build an infrastructure from scratch with new codes, regulation, standards than to try to deal with a vested interest in the old codes and standards that make you have to transform to something new. So they're moving. But a lot of it has to do with the public discourse. And that means there needs to be a younger generation in Egypt coming to the, to the streets. Now, in those 130 countries where the young people did strikes, there was absolutely strikes in developing countries.
but it, you never know when it's going to catch on in a particular country. There is a lot, of, a lot of movement around the world, but in the Middle East, there's strangely not much. And that's too bad, because in the book, we have a study from the World Bank this year that says they're going to have it really bad because they're all fossil fuel related. And when it goes, what are they going to do? The reason we have so much migration into Europe from the Middle East is because it's too hot. They can't grow crops. They, they can't live. You can't live in 123, 124 temperature. They're all fleeing to Europe and rather die than stay there. So the migration from climate change is now in the millions and millions. It's going to be in the hundreds of millions. We're going to have to figure out what we do with mobile cities that can move and transport people in ways that we haven't even understood today. But it's a matter of it'll take off. When it takes off in a country, it'll take off quick. There was no Greta Thunberg a few years ago. Now there's millions of them. And it, it wasn't that she was the first one to do that. Some media got a hold of it, said this kid's out there every Friday striking and not going to school, and it captured the attention. So it can move quick. We're the most social creature on the earth. Is there one over here? Hi there, great talk, thank you. Um, I'm wondering, what are your thoughts on cement and steel, which are uh, two of the aspects that we need for infrastructure, but very high energy intensity? We have a section in the book on the hard to abate sectors. And the cement and steel are right up there, along with plastics and aviation fuel, et cetera. In Halte de France and in the Netherlands, we have high-tech parks now where we're bringing chemists together with biologists and geneticists to search for uh, uh, biological processes that can be alternative to petrochemical in construction, cement, et cetera. Um, I uh, was with somebody, I just lost his name, uh, got an honorary degree uh, uh, several years ago. We were together, and uh, he's come up with uh, uh, alternatives to cement, much cheaper and with very little carbon footprint. Let me use steel as an example. This just came out two weeks ago. You can Google it up. The largest steel uh, company in the west of the United States, in Colorado. They built all of the western part of the U.S. from this steel company. They just announced, this is really a massive operation, they just announced that they're going to be all solar. I think within the next couple of years, they're already laying it all out. It's all solar. All around the place, solar. Cheaper, marginal cost near free, they're getting off. All you have to do is do it. They're doing it, and they're going to get a return on investment in real time. They're doing it. And uh, by the way, aviation fuels, I don't know if you know this, but many of the airplanes you fly on have bi biofuels in the airplanes, United, Qantas, many of the airlines. It's just, just not enough to do the job yet. So th this, in the book, we say that's the hardest part, get to the, the hard to abate. That's the last 20 percent. We can go the 80 percent now. The last 20, uh, the breakthroughs we're seeing in research between the biologists and the chemists will be there within the next eight or ten years. Hello there. I'd like to ask a question, if it's okay. Eddie, okay, this well, is going to be a tough one. Yeah. No, uh, so this is Dylan Logan Christian, where it's Christian, and I wanted to ask you what you think of what Sidewalk Labs is doing here in Toronto. Well, you got to read the book. It's in chapter one. <laughs> I use them as the test case. It's just, it was so easy. Uh, look, I was up here when the announcement, should I really do this now? I was up here when the announcement was made. I was up uh, in Ottawa with ministers there talking about some possible plans that didn't come through at the federal level. And they asked me, what do you think about this announcement? Uh, Premier Trudeau came to Toronto and the Premier of the region and, and si what is it, sidewalks? And Google and the, the head of Google came in. I said, shit's going to hit the fan tomorrow morning across Canada. I'm sorry, but that's what I said. You know, wait to see the response. Nobody is opposed to smart technology. No one, I don't think in this room, you all have your smartphones and you have your smart appliances. No one's opposed to it. It's just when you're dealing with something like infrastructure, that's a public good. In the book, I'm opposed to privatizing infrastructure. You don't privatize a public good. What happened in, the, in 1980 when Reagan and Thatcher came into office is that the capitalist markets had kind of peaked in terms of their potential markets. And there was one last fruit, and that is infrastructure, because everyone needs it, so it's a captive audience. You can't do better than that. You don't need any advertising, right? Everyone needs the water system and the highways. And so they came up with this kind of neoliberal liberal argument from the University of Chicago School 
And they said, well, you know, infrastructure, governments, there's a monopoly, they're bureaucratic, they don't innovate, they're slow, it doesn't work. There's no history to suggest this. The railroads ran fine in Canada, didn't they? Your water systems worked in Canada, correct? Your, your, your electricity worked in Canada, correct? Everything seemed to work. This was just a mythology. But in any event, when we find out is when you privatize infrastructure, companies will strip the assets. Do you think they're going to, in a poor community where you have an old drainage system and water system, you're hit by climate change, do you think they're going to improve the water system if it takes away from the bottom line? It just doesn't happen. So, but I'm not opposed to using the best expertise in the private sector. And there's a new model, which we're sporting uh, all around the world. It's called energy savings companies. How many know what it is? ESCOs. It's been around 30 years. There's some big companies like Siemens, Schneider, and our group and others that are doing this. But this is a totally different model than traditional capitalism. And traditional market capitalism, there are parts of, of economic theory and practice, I would say. But in traditional capitalism, I'll give you a quick anecdote. My freshman year, 1963, the Wharton School, the marketing professor was a bit of an ass. He put this huge Latin phrase on the blackboard, caveat emptor, young people. The buyer beware. He said, you don't have to learn anything else this next year. You don't even have to come to class. Just know this. Well, it's interesting because he's right, because in, in capitalist markets, the seller always knows more than the buyer. So it's unfair from the get-go. If you buyers knew what the seller knew, you probably would be negotiating a much higher price and not buying it, right? Correct? ESCOs have a different model. Within energy service companies, the ESCOs come in across all sorts of competencies. They can be ICT. They can be uh, local SMEs are the best because they can blockchain in and ICT and um, communication and mobility and logistics. And they finance all of the, your infrastructure for you whether it's privately owned or whether the infrastructure is part of the local government, they finance the whole thing, hopefully with green bonds, with pension funds. And then how do they make their returns? They make the returns by the aggregate efficiency gains they secure. If they don't secure those gains, they don't get the returns. You don't need ESG. It's built into the business model. So they can help put, out your, put your national power grid up. SMEs in every region of, of Canada can do this. And the SMEs will get their return by the... Uh, the energy savings on the electricity grid. They can retrofit the buildings, social housing, um, massive uh, building infrastructure. They get the returns by the aggregate efficiencies they gain. They can put in the charging stations. They can put in the solar panels. They can uh, help your business increase their aggregate efficiency. And then some of those returns go back to them. And when it's paid off, you still own it. You've owned it for the whole time. And you can do a, a reversion of the model that even while the, while the time they're doing it, you can split it. They get 70% until it's paid off. You get 30 and then you get the rest, or 50% or whatever you want. This ain't the capitalism I grew up on, is it? All the responsibility is with them. Then I like private enterprise because I've got to tell you, there's a lot of expertise out there. I work with companies all over the world, and it's the SMEs and cooperatives that are going to make this happen all over the regions of Canada. You've got a lot of digital technology expertise under 40 in this country. You just need the local regions to set up those peer assemblies in the cities and regions and get the job done. I'm going to take one last question because you've been very, who wants it? This will be a quick answer. Or maybe not. Why do you think you need nuclear power? All right. All right. I don't talk about nuclear power because it's a, non, it's a non-starter. Nuclear power is $112 per, per megawatt hour. It's way out of the game. It can't compete. And the, uh, we had one nuclear power plant being built in our United States since Three Mile Island. Okay. And it's billions and billions overrun, and it's, and, and, and it's taking all of that overrun and making the consumers pay more in their rate base. It's not working. It's not even online. There's, there's a lot of problems with nuclear power, but I'll just give you one. It's not just the waste we can't get rid of. It's the water. Now, when I released this data in France, they were shocked. Over 40% of all the fresh water in France, and there's 70% nuclear and electricity, over 40% of the fresh water in France is going to cool nuclear reactors. Problem, with climate change, the water is so hot in the summer, they can't use it in southern France, and they're closing down the nuclear power plants. You see it on the news every two or three days in the summer. And once they use the cool water, if they're lucky enough to have it sometimes, when it goes back from the nuclear reactors, it's hot and dehydrating ecosystems that are already facing drought, and they can't grow their crops. And you could have saltwater nuclear power plants, but then you get Fukushima because you have hurricanes and typhoons on the coast. 
Why would you build a nuclear reactor for billions of dollars when millions of people would have solar and wind at near zero marginal cost and the fixed costs are down to nothing and you could democratize energy in the world and have self-sufficiency in the regions you're in? Finally, in an era of climate change and cyber terrorism, you don't want to rely on a few nuclear power plants. You want to have solar and wind everywhere so that if there's a cyber terrorist attack or a climate event, you can go off the grid with $25 technology and re-aggregate in mini grids in your local neighborhood and keep the power going, keep your EV going, keep your life going. If Puerto Rico had this technology and it's all right, they'd have been up and running within four weeks. All right? Good night, everybody. Uh, okay, don't forget, as you rush out, uh, to get your, your book. We'll also say that uh, we will have uh, Carbine Street Guitars here at Ennis Town Hall on December 12th with Ron Mann in attendance. And apropos to this evening, the film Anthropocene with the director Jennifer Bikewall will be coming in February. So be aware of those things. If you want to be on our mailing list or email list for events, just check with someone outside. And I want to thank Jerry Mirifkin for coming and giving us this inspiring talk. Uh, for a performance level that most of us as professors would like to imitate. Uh, and thanks again to Eddie Moretti and his team for bringing Jeremy here. <laughs>